and we'll go ahead and start here. And we have as our presenter this evening, we have Kyle Hill. Kyle Hill is from Coburn, uh, was, was very active in some, uh, some environmental conferences that, that UVA wise uh, did some a couple of research projects and he's an avid outdoorsman and, and strong proponent for, uh, for conservative thinking, uh, uh, conservation thinking that is. And, uh, and I want to turn it over to him. He wanted, uh, we asked him, we brought up this idea of talking about fishing for this part of the world. And he's the first person I thought of. I said, well, I have somebody who's going to be perfect for that. So, uh, so I'm going to let, let Kyle speak with you all. And, uh, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box, or if you want to wait to the end, we'll, uh, we'll unmute you and, and let you just, uh, ask him directly. All right, Kyle. Thank you, Phil. Uh, like you said, my name's Kyle Hill. Uh, live in Coburn, Virginia. And uh, today, or this evening rather, I want to talk about fishing. We're going to talk a lot about uh, different techniques and a um, uh, few areas that I like to fish. And uh, So the first thing uh, we're going to talk about are uh, two different types of techniques. One which is fly fishing and the other which I'm going to call modern. Because fly fishing is kind of based, is a little bit more older technique of fishing than, uh, than these other types of fishing that we're going to talk about, which are spinning and bait casting. Which what we're going to be talking about is just the basic type of rod and reel that uh, is used for that technique. So uh, fly fishing utilizes a weighted line and a, a smaller line, a leader, which they call it, and then to cast a small, almost weightless most of the time, uh, fly, which uh, imitates things like uh, small insects, uh, even fish and amphibians and mammals and things of that nature. Uh, fly fishing can be used for about any type of species of fish. Uh, in our area, it's most well known for trout, uh, but can be also be used for other freshwater fish and also saltwater. Uh, I've spent a lot of time fly fishing, fly fish for trout, uh, different species of panfish, uh, crappy, bluegills, things of that nature, and also largemouth and have been pretty successful at it. So uh, the first thing we'll talk about is the basics of fly fishing. So you'll have your rod, you have your reel. Uh, the first thing that's in your reel is the backing, which is if you catch a large fish and you run out of your fly line and your leader, uh, if all else fails, you go into your backing. So, uh, and then you have the fly line, which is the weighted line I was talking about. And that allows you to cast uh, those small flies, which we'll be talking about here in just a second, as opposed to more basic fishing, what most people are used to, you put a weight uh, on the end of your line. So, uh, well, just a second. Sorry about that. Uh, in most, in like I said, in basic fishing scenarios, you use a, a weight, a split shot, a thing, things of that nature, to uh, cast your lure or whatever or your bait or whatever you're fishing with. Well, the fly line is weighted and it acts as that split shot or that that weight on the end of your line, and it allows you to cast that. And uh, you utilize a forward and backward motion uh, from 10 o'clock to two o'clock. And that allows you to gain enough momentum in the fly line to allow you to lay the, lure, the fly down on the water. So the fly fishing is fairly easy once you get used to it and it requires minimal tackle. Uh, besides your rod and your reel and your backing and your fly line and the leader, which I talked about, uh, about the only other things you need are your flies, your flies and your tippet. And uh, what the tippet is, 
is uh, your leader is only so long. Usually it's 12 to 13 feet, something, somewhere in that nature. And uh, the tippet you tie on to the end of your leader and it keeps you from losing so much leader every time that you retie. So uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about are the flies, what you're using to catch the fish with when it comes to fly fishing. Uh, like I said, they can be different things. Uh, over here to the, to the left here, we have uh, some flies that have been tied to look like small minnows or uh, sculpin type deals. And then next, farther to the right, you have what they call dry flies. Dry flies sit on top of the water and act as like, they look like an emerger of like a stone fly or a mayfly or something in that nature. The fish will come up and get them. And then all the way down here on the bottom, these are uh, little nymphs. These are actually pheasant tail nymphs, or the, this one here is a pheasant tail nymph. And those act as like the, the larval, the nymph stage of the bugs uh, in the stream. And uh, most of these flies are mostly used for trout. So, and then we have some bigger flies here which would be used for things like largemouth bass or uh, northern pike or muskie or things of that nature. And uh, these imitate larger things like uh, this one down here might imitate something like a bird. Uh, this one imitates like a mouse. So, and then we have, I also said they could be used for saltwater. So you can see this fly here is used to imitate a very large uh, like a, a mullet or something like that uh, in the uh, in the ocean or like here you have a shrimp so uh, just depending on what you're fishing for just depends on the size of the fly and uh, the larger the fish uh, every all the basics for fly fishing stay the same but everything just gets bigger as you fish for bigger fish so uh, now we're going to talk about what I what I want to call modern fishing equipment, which uh, is what most of us are probably a little bit more used to. Uh, you have spinning, uh, spinning rods, spinning reels, and uh, bait casting uh, reels and rods. And uh, these just these are. Uh, utilize more of the weight of the actual lure as opposed to the, the line that like we were talking about with the fly fishing. Uh, spinning rods, I like to use them more for a finesse style of fishing uh, as opposed to the, the bait casters I like to use for uh, more heavier duty fish and bait such as fishing for largemouth uh, bass or catfish or things of that nature. My spinning rods, I like to use them for like uh, river fishing for smallmouth bass, smaller fish, uh, red eyes, bluegills, trout, things of like that. Uh, but I mean, either one of these can be used for about anything. It just depends on what you're comfortable with and your skill level with that because bait casting rods are, I wouldn't say very hard, but they're not easy to learn. You're not just gonna pick it up and say, oh, I know how to use a spinning rod like you would a spinning rod. The bait caster takes a little bit more skill uh, so now I want to talk about the tackle that we use with spinning rods and bait casting rods and reels. Uh, of course, there's numerous types of baits uh, that we you can use, and they can be as simple or as complex as you want to get. Uh, I've seen baits that uh, try to explain how they work, and then it would take a physicist to figure out how it works. Uh, and you take things like a, just a hook and a night crawler, I mean, it's pretty basic. So I wanna break this down into six different uh, categories. We'll talk about the terminal tackle, which will include like just your basic hooks and things like that. There's your live bait that I'm pretty comfortable with, uh, artificial plastics, the hard baits, uh, spinners, and then also jigs. So let's start off with the terminal tackle. Terminal tackle just is a fancy word for all your basics that you need to fish with, uh, like night crawlers and live bait and things like that. Uh, that's your hooks, uh, your sinkers, 
your bobbers, uh, swivels that you might need. So next you have your live bait, which to use most live bait, you basically just need the hook, the weight, and then if you want an indicator such as a bobber, or if you want it to float up off of the bottom, I do that a lot when I'm fishing with minnows on the river or in a pond or things like, place like that. I'll put a bobber on there and then put a split shot and then my hook with my minnow. And what that does is that keeps that minnow down in the water column so he's not coming to the surface the whole time that you're trying to fish with him. Of course, your live bait can vary anything you want to fish with that's live pretty much. I mean, worms, minnows, uh, crayfish. Uh, in the picture there, you got frogs, grasshoppers. I mean, the sky's the limit when it comes to live bait, as long as you're within the legal ordinances of what you can use and what you can't use. You can't go using a black snake or something like that to fish with. Uh, next are your artificial plastics. Uh, these are probably the most similar to live bait because uh, they're the thing you're looking for is you're trying to imitate that live bait with without uh, having the hassle of trying to deal with live bait. So uh, you got things like your crayfish here, uh, this small pink worm here, which I will talk about a lot during this session. And then also down here, this swim bait, which is meant to imitate a small minnow or something. Uh, and these help a lot because you can catch multiple fish on one bait and you're not having to try to put more live bait on or trying to keep live bait alive, which with minnows and things like that, this time of year where it's so hot, uh, you buy them from a place that sells them. And by the time you get where you're going, if you don't have a good aerator in your minnow bucket, they're dead. So this saves a lot of that hassle. Uh, the terminal tackle used for this is pretty much about the same. It might vary just a little bit with what you're using for your uh, live bait. You're still gonna have your hooks and your weights. And if you wanna get it up off the bottom, you can use your bobber or you can use it as an indicator also. So I really like artificial plastics. I used to, when I was younger, I fished with live bait a lot, but now I've, I've come to where I really like using artificial plastics. Uh, just because of the, the, how easy it is to use them. Okay, next we're gonna talk about hard baits. And these are baits that have either been molded into hard plastic or also carved from uh, things like wood. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of technique that goes into making these baits. And uh, they've been made for probably hundreds of years and some of the baits that they have now that are hard baits are just, it's just unbelievable that they can make something do that. So uh, the good, the thing I like about hard baits, which is unique from what we've been talking about is everything's encompassed into one uh, piece. So your weight is the weight of your wood or your plastic, or sometimes they put tungsten weights or lead weights or things like that inside of the bait. Uh, so, your weight's there, your bait's there, and then your hooks are also attached to it. So I have here a, to call it deep diving crankbait. So I don't know if you can hear that, but it rattles. And uh, that weight transfer is what helps you to throw this bait. And it's got its treble hooks here. And what you do is you reel this bait in the water and it dives. When it dives, it moves side to side motion and with the color pattern you have here, it looks something like, like a crayfish or something like that. Uh, let's see. I've also got some like this, which are about the same purpose. The only difference in this one and the other one is when you quit reeling this one, it will float. You quit reeling this one, it will sink, but it still has that side to side and that rattling motion. So, uh, also have jerk baits. Which I got pictures of also. Jerk baits uh, can either sink, uh, suspend, or uh, float. Uh, this is a suspending jerk bait. What it will do is it will stop in the same spot. 
and you jerk it and it darts side to side and it will stop in that same spot when you stop jerking it. And that's uh, that creates a reaction bite with the fish. Um, because fish is used to seeing something move, 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 and then it stops. And it's like, why did it stop? And then it just reaches and grabs it, and then you've got it. So, uh, and then top water hard plastics is something like this. Uh, it sits on top of the water, of course, but it moves in a walking, a side to side walking motion when you work it through the water. And uh, that can look like anything. It can look like a look like a fish dying on the surface of the water, or maybe a frog going across, or a snake, or a bird, or something like that that's fell in the water. Uh, see also here we have things like, uh, that look like little crickets. Uh, fished the Clinch River last weekend, and uh, this was my number one that caught most of my fish. I caught a 18 inch smallmouth that weighed probably almost three pounds on one of these little bitty, I mean, they're, they're tiny, but I mean, Big fish, big fish eat little baits too. So, but that's your hard baits. Uh, you can see down here. This is a just a variety of topwater hard plastic or hard baits, and they just vary so much colors and uh, types of baits that they that they are. Uh, you can, I mean, the sky's the limit with those. So jigs. Uh, these are probably my favorite baits to fish with besides the artificial plastics uh, because I make my own. Uh, I've got some pictures of some here in a second I'll show, but uh, in, I make my own uh, out of various things like hair and feathers. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a big time duck hunter. Uh, so in the winter when I shoot my ducks, I keep the feathers all year long. And then in the spring, I use them to tie my own jigs. Uh, also work at a horse barn, uh, so when we trim the horse's manes, I keep the hair off the mane and uh, use the, also use that to tie jigs. Uh, this is another jig, one that I've tied. Uh, this is made out of bucktail. Uh, I bought this. You can see some of it's dyed like a chartreuse color. Uh, you can buy that at like Cabela's or anything, but the jigs, hand tying the jigs for me is that that's what makes it for me for tie, uh, fishing with jigs. They work really well. Plus, you get the satisfaction of hey, I made that. So, they also make them out of synthetic uh, materials. Also, uh, these are some pictures of some jigs that I've tied. Uh, I've caught fish on all of these. This little bitty one here is like a thirty-second ounce jig head. Uh, the jig head, I didn't mention that a second ago, I should have, let me clarify that. A jig uh, is just a hook and the lead is molded to the hook. So that gives your weight and everything encompassed in one uh, piece. Also kind of like the hard baits. But this little bait here, uh, last winter I caught about a 26 inch rainbow trout out of the South Fork of the Holston River in Bristol on that little bitty tiny jig. I mean, that's laying in my hand, it's it's tiny. Uh, these over here, I use them for uh, uh, what they call stripers, striped bass, uh, hybrid striped bass, uh, white bass. And then these smaller jigs down here, this one down here, uh, I like it a lot for trout. But you can see there's such a variety. Uh, this one down here is some of those I was talking about, I made out of the duck feathers. Uh, that was out of a mallard flank feathers, which is the flanks, which is what's under their wing, the feathers under their wing. And then over here we have the, uh, <clears throat> to, all the way to the right, to the top. Um, this is uh, some of the synthetic stuff I was talking about. And most of this is used for uh, largemouth bass fishing. My cousin actually makes a lot of these. And me and him swap around, which is kind of nice, because I'll give him some some jigs made out of some hair, some feathers, or something like that, and then he'll give me some of these to fish for largemouth uh, out of this synthetic stuff, so we just trade around. Uh, next thing I'm gonna talk about is probably one of the most versatile baits, in my opinion, out of all the ones we've talked about are spinners. 
uh, spinners utilize a blade uh, that flashes, it spins through the water. I wish I had one, but I don't. But uh, the little blade here spins around that shaft and it flashes as it goes through the water and it looks like a bait fish flashing. And uh, I've caught everything on these. Uh, I've even caught catfish and things of that like that that you wouldn't think would eat something like that. Uh, these over here are called spoons, but they're still in that spinner family. Uh, this is actually called a little Cleo all the way to the right there. And uh, that's my number one trout spinner. That's what I like to use for trout a lot. So, okay, I've talked about the basics about fishing. Now I wanna kinda talk about what I like to do around here when it comes to fishing. So uh, Wise County, this area in general, Kentucky, Tennessee, has endless fishing opportunities, whether it be small streams for trout four or five inches long, or it be uh, large catfish, 50, 60 pounds. I mean, you can catch about anything around here. Uh, a lot of the reservoirs and lakes and streams and stuff we have around here have a lot of different species. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about is Virginia does uh, what they call their stock trout waters. And uh, many of the streams and lakes and rivers around here uh, are stocked by, it's the DWR now, Department of Wildlife Resources. It used to be the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. Uh, they had to get fancy and change it for some reason. And uh, they stock brook, rainbow, and brown trout in these streams. And you can go online and look this up uh, on a Department of Game, Department of Wildlife Resources page. But uh, right now they have it shut off. They, they won't tell anybody where they're stocking because of all the COVID stuff going on. So, but in order to fish those stock trout waters, uh, you have to have a trout fishing license. That is required. Uh, so if you're just, if you say, well, I'm just going fishing for bluegills. Well, it doesn't matter. If they stock trout there, you have to have a, a trout fishing license from, I think it's October to June or July, I believe it is. I'm not sure exact dates on that, but. So to talk a little bit about uh, license requirements. One thing that I always like to talk about when I'm talking to people about fishing and hunting, and it doesn't, any of that kind of thing is I'm a, I'm big on making sure I have everything that I'm supposed to have to be legal. Uh, so in the state of Virginia, to fish in freshwater, you have to have the Virginia Freshwater Fishing License, which for adults, I think is like $23. Uh, the National Forest Permit, if the body of water is located on National Forest, uh, and like we talked about with the stock, stock trout waters, the trout fishing license. Uh, those three things you have to have in this area pretty much everywhere, except for just a few places that uh, don't require that. Well, they, they require the fishing license, but not maybe not the National Forest Permit or the trout fishing license. Uh, so the first one I wanna talk about is probably by far my favorite place to fish around here, and that's Bark Camp Lake. Uh, many of you might know where that's at. Uh, it's located in Scott County, Virginia. It takes, I'm located in Coburn and it takes me about 10 to 15 minutes to get there from my house. Uh, species possible there, uh, catch a lot of trout, all three species, uh, brown, rainbow, and brook trout, large mouth bass, uh, catch big large mouth bass and catch little large mouth bass there. I mean, you don't ever know. Uh, some fish species, uh, pumpkin seed sunfish, green sunfish. Uh, there's a lot of crap, crop, crappy crappie in that lake. Uh, what I call war mouse or red eyes in there. A few catfish, I've seen them, but I've never caught any. And then just your common carp. And I didn't put in there also, there used to be northern pike in there. Uh, not heard of any occurrences of them in the last little bit, but it's possible there could be a couple of those left. Uh, this is a stock trout waters. So uh, the limit on the trout 
is six trout per person per day, and it, they must be at least seven inches. And it's uh, electric motors only if you're using a boat with a motor. So uh, here's some of the trout. This is actually the biggest trout I've caught out of that lake so far. I caught it year before last in February. It was 20, five, 26 inches, probably weighed close to four pounds. Uh, this picture on the left, the trout on the right, that is a normal size stock trout for that lake. And then the one on the left is the, the big one I caught. So you can see there's some pretty good size fish in there uh, when it comes to trout. Uh, now we're gonna talk about these beasts. Uh, my cousin that I was talking about makes the jigs. He's a big time bass fisherman. And uh, these two are the two biggest large mouth me and him together have caught out of this lake. Uh, he caught both of them, but I caught the big trout. So uh, the fish on the left was caught last spring. Uh, it was 24, 25 inches, probably weighed close to nine pounds, I guess. And uh, the one on the right, he didn't really know length or anything on it, but it was bigger than that. Uh, they've caught them out of there. I've heard 10, 11, 12 pounds. They're in there very good size. So if you're a bass fisherman, it's a pretty good place to go. So uh, next place I want to talk about is the Clinch River, which many of you have probably heard of before. Uh, strings all the way through Russell County, uh, Scott County, a little bit of Wise County, and then down into Tennessee next to Kyle's Ford. Uh, this, this river's eat up of fish. Uh, if you just wanna go catch fish, don't care what size they are, go to the Clinch River because you will catch fish. Uh, some of the species you'll encounter there, smallmouth bass, walleye, red eyes, uh, various sunfish species, also carp species, uh, catfish. And then I didn't know they were in there till the other day, but we also started catching a few white bass out of that river. Um, the only license need for that river is uh, the freshwater fishing license. Uh, most of these species can be talk, caught on uh, some of the basic tackle we've talked about in the last little bit. Uh, the spinners, uh, artificial worms, uh, the bait fish, uh, minnows and night crawlers. Uh, I've got these here, these little swim baits. You can't really tell, but it's it's a bluish color on top, and then it's chartreuse on the bottom. Uh, when we were fishing there last week, what I didn't catch on that little creek hopper it's called that I was talking about earlier, I caught on these. Uh, they're really good. I buy these at the Clinch Life Outfitters in St. Paul. So, uh, picture on the, the left here, uh, my neighbor across the road here caught this walleye uh, back in February, I think it was. Uh, it weighed over 11 pounds. And then the picture on the right here is me with smallmouth, decent size smallmouth. Uh, about average size of what you'll catch out of that river when it comes to smallmouth. So, uh, Next place I want to talk about is Little Stony Creek. Uh, many of you might have heard of Little Stony Falls. Uh, Bark Camp that I was talking about earlier uh, makes the head of this stream, this creek, uh, and then it runs all the way into the Clinch River, uh, just a few miles up front stream from Dungannon, Virginia. Uh, this is my go-to place when it comes to trout. Uh, I like tr trout fishing more than I do anything. Uh, they stock this creek with uh, brown, brook, and rainbow trout, uh, so that's all three species that we have. Um, one thing to note on this stream, a uh, section of this stream from the third falls, uh, which if you're not familiar, you go to the Little Stony Falls parking lot, and then the third fall down is where it starts. And then it ends just upstream from where the creek ends. Uh, there's a section there that's single hook, artificial only, and it's catch and release. Uh, this is done because they're stocking fingerling trout in here, trying to get a native population going. So. But common tackle that I use for this river or for this stream 
our uh, spinners and then little trout worms. This little pink worm that I was talking about earlier, I've caught probably hundreds of trout out of the out of little Stony Creek on this little pink worm. And what I do is I take a a, a number six light wire or number four light wire uh, pan fish hook and thread this on it with a split shot about 10 to 12 inches and just let it drift through the current and they absolutely eat it up. And then also uh, artificial salmon eggs and then real salmon eggs work pretty well in here too. So, so here's a, some pictures of some trout that I've caught out of this stream. Uh, all the way to the left there, the top, that's uh, probably the two biggest brook trout I've caught out of that stream. They were both about 16 inches long, which is really good size for brook trout, especially in a creek that small. Uh, middle picture here is a really nice size uh, rainbow trout that I caught a few years ago. And then all the way to the right is a really nice brown trout that I caught a couple years ago. So this this river, this creek, excuse me, is uh, has some potential and does is a really good trout stream for some really good quality fish if you're looking to catch trout. Uh, so now I've talked about everything, talked about where I like to fish, talked about various fishing tackle. Uh, now I want to talk about what I've got in my tackle box because you might be wondering. Uh, I've I'm a minimalist when it comes to tackle now. Used to I had everything under the sun in my box, and now I'm just down to the barren minimum. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, for the trout, uh, number six light wire panfish hooks, uh, number twelve salmon egg hooks. Uh, I like to keep a variety of different sizes of split shot weights with me. Uh, Berkeley trout eggs in, there's some various colors that I like pretty well. And then also salmon eggs. I like having those with me. And then if I've not talked about it enough and not stressed it enough for trout, uh, Berkeley trout worms in the bubblegum paint color, I don't go trout fishing without them. So uh, also the Berkeley gulp minnows, which I do not have with me but I've got something that looks similar to it. Uh, they look kind of like kind of like this right here. They, they're just a minnow imitation. And uh, they have minnow scent too, which helps a lot. You wouldn't think so, but that scent makes a big difference. And what I do is I do them like I have this. I thread them up on a jig head. Uh, this is probably a 16th ounce jig head, which I have listed next. And what I'll do is I'll throw that into the current or into the lake or whatever. And I'll let it sink maybe 1,005, 1,006, something like that. And then I'll just rapidly bounce my rod tip and reel that in very slowly. And that gives it an erratic action. It looks like a bait fish going through the water. And trout like that really well. Uh, I keep some copper spinners with me, uh, black rooster tails, which is uh, in that uh, spinner family also. And then my rod, I like a seven foot light action rod uh, with four to six pound monofilament line. Uh, monofilament line uh, floats, so no matter what kind of bait I'm using, uh, that line works really well for it. But that's for uh, what I like fishing for trout. Uh, now I'll talk about my river fishing, what I use for that, which I've talked about a little bit already. But this is pretty effective for both bass and sunfish species, also the walleye and the Clinch River and things of that nature. Uh, the Rebel Crick Hopper, which is I was talking about earlier, the grasshopper imitation, uh, that works really well. I would recommend if you go to buy them, buy two of them because you'll break one off before you know it. And then you'll be like, well, I was catching fish and now I'm not. So uh, the blue and chartreuse swim baits I was talking about earlier from Clinch Life Outfitters in St. Paul, I really like those a lot. Uh, I don't think I bought any other swim bait except those. I keep her sold out of them. So if you can't find them, it's probably my fault. Uh, and I also keep uh, eighth ounce and 16th ounce jig hooks with me to uh, thread these swim baits up on the hook, which I had it. I don't know what to do. Anyway, what I do is 
take this swim bait. Let me get it in the camera. Take this swim bait, and you want the the big part of the paddle facing down, and you want to start in the middle of the bait and slowly go up through there until you've reached a point where your hook's popping out. And it should look something like this, and you want to keep it very fairly straight. And what I'll do with these is I'll throw them out in the current also and just slowly reel. I want to keep just a little bit of slack in my line when I'm reeling, but I want uh, I want tension on it too so I can so I can feel if something's hitting it. Because lots of times they'll hit this and they'll they'll hit it just one good time and then they're gone. And then they may not hit it again. So because it's most of the time it's just a reaction bite. They see something coming through the water and they just hit it real quick and then they turn and go the other way. So you gotta be ready. Uh, and then also those gulp minnows, which I was talking about earlier, uh, two and a half to three inch size on those. And then I like a seven foot medium-ish action rod, uh, anywhere from four to eight pound monofilament line will be okay for that. Uh, so, uh, but that's all I have. I hope I haven't taken too long, but, uh, if y'all have any questions, I can take them now. Hey, Kyle, I have a question. Um, kayak fishing, that's something I have one son who's just barely starting to get into kayak fishing. Do you have any tips for, uh, is, do you use kayak often, say at Bark Camp Lake? Is that something? Uh, yeah, I use it quite often at Bark Camp. Uh, it's really good for up there. Um, I wouldn't take my best rod, my most expensive rod or anything like that when I'm on a kayak. Right. Uh, and that goes for fishing the river too. I mean, we went last week and one of my buddies lost his fishing rod. It, he had a rod holder in his kayak and the rod tip caught the, uh, a tree limb and jerked his rod out and he didn't know it. So mm. there went 70, 80 bucks down the drain. So. And then the other question I had was just about the uh, the trail from Hanging Rock to Little Stony. Is that fully open now that you know of? Uh, I forgot about that. I don't know if it is or not. Last I knew it wasn't. Okay. So. Yeah, I hadn't heard any updates. I wasn't sure. And it'll be a bushwhack if you decide to go down through there too. So. Yeah, that's all I have. Any, any other questions for Kyle? Nice job. Thank you. Yep. Good stuff, Kyle. Thank you so much. Awesome stuff. Uh, Jaquita said the guest is good for fishing too. What are you catching on the guest river? I fish the guest some. Uh, a lot of smallmouth and red eyes. Do they not stock that with trout in the gorge? No. Too hot? Uh, well, it's not that. It's the water quality. It's, I mean, it's been questionable for the last few years because of straight popping and things of that nature. Uh, but I think if they would look into it, that it could hold a good population of trout. So. It looks like trout water when you go down the, the uh, bike trail. Yeah. I, I did record this and I'm going to play for my kids your comments about being a minimalist because they, they own more, uh, more plastic worms. And, and, uh, I didn't know, you know, two people could own that many worms, but, but yeah, they, they like to get a little bit of everything whenever they can. So I I've like the minimalism it, approach. I've heard that it said, uh, that they, it catches more fishermen than fish. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. All right. If no other questions, Kyle, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. I appreciate you speaking with us tonight. Thank you. And uh, Shad or Jeremy, uh, do you all remember what's coming up next week? It's the snake one, I believe. Okay. Snake ID on Tuesday. Yep. Okay. All right. Then that'll be Matt Springer mm -hmm. from UK again. Dr. Matt Springer. Snake identification. I know that's something that all of the extension agents get calls on this time of year. Uh, people send pictures or, or they'll call on the phone and describe a snake they've, they've seen in their basement and 
and be interested in the ID. So that's uh, that should be a good presentation on Tuesday. Definitely. And then I think you all have another woodcraft on Thursday. Okay. Yep, that's the problem plants, the snakes, uh, bears, and, and water. Okay. Sounds good. Good deal. All right. How to survive if you pass out in the woods. <laughs> try, to, try to crawl away from the crowd if you're gonna if you're gonna die in the woods. All right. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Also, right. Emily has the chicken program tomorrow. I see in the chat. Is that a Zoom or is that something she's got at the office? It's it's a Zoom. Uh, it's uh, if anybody's interested, they can just contact me and we'll we'll get them the link to it. Awesome. Very good. Y'all have a good one. Yeah, you too. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks, Kyle. See you all Tuesday. Thanks, Kyle.